Uh, well, good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to CSIS for today's event. I'm Mark Cancy, and I'm the uh, acting director of the Project on Military and Diplomatic History. Before we start, I need to make a routine announcement, and that is in the likely event of an emergency, I'll tell you what to do. We'll either stay here or go out through the front door or the back door. And with that out of the way, uh, I'd like to move on to today's uh, event. The Project on Military and Diplomatic History uh, aims to expand the uh, awareness of what's happening uh, in those two important uh, but often neglected areas of history. Many of you have been to our previous events. Today's event grew out of a writing competition that the project sponsored with the Society of Military History. Captain James Torrance won the competition uh, with an essay about the relevance of the Strategic Defense Initiative for uh, cyber. Uh, he'll receive the actual uh, award at the Society's uh, conference, I think, next month. But part of the plan was that he would make a presentation here at CSIS. And we wanted to uh, expand that to include some speakers on uh, missile defense and cyber. So what we're going to do is you're going to hear from uh, Captain Torrance uh, for a few minutes uh, to make his argument and make his presentation. And then uh, each of the panelists will speak for a few minutes. We'll have some discussion, and then we'll open it up to uh, questions from the audience. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, Captain Torrance graduated from the Military Academy, and uh, he's a signal officer who's commanded units in Europe and did a tour in Afghanistan. He has multiple master's degrees and is working on his doctorate in strategic security. Uh, Dr. Michael Sulmeyer is director of the Belfer Center's uh, cybersecurity project at Harvard's Kennedy School. Uh, before Harvard, he served as the director for plans and operations for cyber policy in the office of the Secretary of Defense. And previously, he worked on arms control and uh, the maintenance of strategic st stability between the United States and Russia and China. I received his PhD from Oxford, a master's from, in war studies from King's College, uh, and his bachelor in JD from Stanford. And Ian Williams uh, is direct, uh, associate director of the CSIS program uh, on missile defense. And prior to joining CSIS, he was the director of advocacy at the Mich Missile Defense uh, Advocacy Alliance. Uh, he holds a bachelor's from Southern Illinois and a master's in uh, strategic studies. So with that, I'll turn things over to Captain Torrance to talk about his uh, um, essay and his concept. So I'd like to thank CSIS for having me here, and I just want to give a brief uh, 10 to 15 minute overview of my research and kind of how that led me to SDI and some conclusions I developed over the past eight months. Uh, this is the word cloud I put together. Uh, this really helps me when I'm looking at things, and this kind of encapsulates some of the different concepts that I looked at as I was conducting research. So this is the agenda. It's going to go through pretty quick. Um, and it's just, like I said, an overview. We can get more in depth in questions, and I'm sure the panel will, will dig into some of these concepts even more. So this is the question I've been looking to solve with research, and that's how can the United States deter militia state and non-state non actors from conducting cyber attacks against infrastructure critical to its national security? And I'll talk through kind of some of the things I looked at. So one of the first things I did was I looked at the national security strategy this year. Uh, and if you look at the 2017 national security strategy, you'll see that it talks about the fact that cyber, uh, America's response to cyber is a determinant of our future prosperity. 11 years earlier in 2006, cyber was mentioned one time, underlined there in parentheses. So the way I look at things, the rapid rise of cyber from mentioned one time in parentheses to a determinant of American prosperity means that there's little or no experience developing cybersecurity strategy, especially for defense. Up here I have five characteristics of the current cyber environment. Uh, we have the offense has the advantage. There's actually a great uh, quote from Regina Dugan, who was the director of DARPA in 2011. She talked about how to develop you know, cyber code or network code, you might have over 10 million lines that the defender has to protect. And it only takes 125 uh, at times for an attacker to get through that. So that ratio is massively uh, advantageous to the attacker. Uh, you have limited attribution. It's hard to know who conducted an attack both during and after, or to even know if you were attacked. State and non-state actors are now in play. 
uh, which increases the range of potential attackers. It's impossible to communicate with every potential initiator in cyberspace. And the infrastructure critical to national security is susceptible to remote attacks. So I started to look at these characteristics. I was trying to figure out what time period uh, was there something similar. And when I started to look at the Cold War, and the more I read about deterrence theory, uh, I found that the Cold War, in particular ballistic missile defense, is a really good parallel for this. It's not completely analogous, but it can develop lessons, or it has lessons that once identified are applicable to cyberspace. So the canon of deterrence literature was huge during the Cold War. The attacker had the advantage. Uh, Hans Morgenthau actually published a great paper in which he said if more people had nuclear weapons, attribution would be difficult, depending on launch angles and when sonars picked them up. So you have the problem of attribution, you have infrastructure that's susceptible to being attacked uh, remotely. And I think there's a lot of lessons that come from this. And the United States also, and the Soviet Union, had to decide how to defect, how and what critical infrastructure they wanted to protect. So when I got really deep into deterrence theory, and I'm excited to talk more with the panel, we talked a little bit in the back, uh, I found that there's, well, first off, let me say deterrence theory, every person says deterrence is simply and then they give a definition. So after reading about 50 definitions of deterrence, I realized it's not simple at all. Um, and there's multiple types. So the deterrence I studied uh, was mostly from the Cold War era, and it was really informative. And I found there's really, there's, a, there's this threat-based deterrence in which you discuss a military threat um, to a potential attacker, and you threaten them to try to dissuade them from doing something. When you look at non-threat-based deterrence or not contingent upon a threat, Joseph Nye talks about this, and what he said, Again, deterrence is simply trying to dissuade someone from doing something uh, by convincing them that the costs outweigh their gains. Not necessarily a threat, and I think it's a different thing to discuss in cyberspace, uh, and it'll come into play a little bit later. So when you look at the limitations of deterrence, uh, I've highlighted three here. You have this idea of communication, and Keith Payne talked about this, and Lawrence Friedman. How do you effectively communicate that the costs of attacking are going to uh, outweigh the gains, the potential gains, and how do you make sure that the potential initiator receives that message? In cyberspace, I don't think it's possible, but in deterrence theory, it's something to consider. When you look at rationality, and we were talking about this in the back too, Stephen Quackenbush wrote a great article when he talked about how preferences are subjective. They're not objective, and preferences lead uh, to one making decisions, which are rational in the eyes of the attacker. So understanding what rationality is and deterrence, and how, do you, how does that come into play when trying to develop a strategy? The last thing is attribution. If you don't know who committed or will commit an attack, it's hard to effectively deter because there's no way to impose cost on the attacker. What I want to talk about now are some of the benefits of deterrence. Um, so you have actor-specific deterrence, and that's really, uh, again, Keith Payne, Lawrence Friedman, Alexander George, Richard Smoke, they talked about this notion that if you can tailor your deterrence strategy to the potential attacker, uh, then you have a higher chance of being effective. Will it work? Not necessarily, but the probability is higher. So obviously there's a problem in cyber with the number of potential actors. You can't develop actor-specific uh, deterrence for every potential actor, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So you have defense-focused uh, deterrence, uh, and that's really gonna be, uh, Bernard Brody talks about this, and that's the idea of a retaliatory force that can survive in cyber. Potentially it's infrastructure that's resilient to an attack. So if the cost of an attacker, um, so you can convince basically an attacker that even if he's successful with an attack, uh, then you can still recover, then that cost is not worth it because the end result doesn't help him achieve his gains. So the last is deterrence to provide options. Uh, this is big by, again, Alexander George and Richard Smoke, uh, and they talk about how deterrence uh, is not necessarily an end in itself, but it can help provide more options uh, in cyber, whether it's to buy time, to prevent attribution or to come up with a di diplomatic solution. So I want to transfer on to uh, missile defense and strategic nuclear forces and uh, how some of the concepts of trying to deter uh, Russian aggression applied to strategic nuclear forces correlates uh, or translates to cyberspace. So there's three principles uh, that I came across uh, through reading uh, the likes of Herman Kahn and Brody and Friedman and really you have the concepts of shelter, mobility and concealment and dispersion. And the idea of shelter is you're protecting um, your nuclear weapons from being attacked so that you can survive a second strike. The problem is if you're overpowered by a strong offense, then your shelter does you no good. So what do you have to do? Well, you have to move your weapons around. You have to disperse them in multiple locations. You know, we have submarines, uh, we have flights in the air 24-7, uh, we have silos, 
And what that does is it helps create uncertainty for the attacker. If there's a 1958 report uh, called The Implications of Atomic Parity, and it's fascinating because it talks about how much it would cost a potential attacker um, to figure out where all of your sites are to attack you. And Lawrence Friedman actually said uh, that the arms race uh, through, through mobility and concealment, uh, the nuclear arms race could be stopped. And the last one is dispersion, and it really goes along with the other two. Um, so what I want to talk about now is how I think that relates to cyberspace. So when I look at shelter, I equate that to encryption, and that's the preventing a brute force attack against your critical infrastructure. When you look at mobility and dispersion, I look at that as decentralization. Dispersing data to multiple locations and concealment, I look at that as keeping the location of the data hidden to create uncertainty for the attacker. And uh, Eric Gartz and John Lindsay, uh, a team of political scientists that are doing some research into cybersecurity, did a really cool experiment in which they did a red versus a blue team, and they found that even though their system was hacked, the attacker couldn't find the data and eventually left. Um, so there's, there's some interesting uh, research going on about concealment, even if, you, these are, uh, even if your defenses are breached. So what I, what I do now is really talk about SDI uh, briefly, and then I know that uh, Ian's gonna talk about it some more in a little bit. So when you have SDI, uh, why I think it's a great case study in comparison to cyberspace is because you, you have an attempt to develop an impenetrable defense, at least that's what was discussed, which by the way was 35 years ago today on March 23rd uh, when Reagan made his Star Wars speech uh, yeah, to make uh, nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. The technology did not yet exist. You have an environment that favored a strong offense, and you had actors unwilling to lay down their weapons. Gorbachev actually told Reagan, I'll, I'll get all my nukes away if you stop SDI. And he said, no, it's too important uh, to achieving defense. So I think that's key with actors unwilling to relinquish their weapons, and I think that makes sense in cyberspace. So what Reagan did is he, did, he set up a National Security uh, Decision Directives 85 and 6-83, which effectively created the Fletcher and the Hoffman panel. And he asked two questions. Is SDI a viable defense strategy? And does the technology currently exist to begin R&D on SDI? So both panels came back and said yes. I know we have some members here today uh, that were involved in that. Um, and they did a lot of research. And what I think is interesting, uh, Dr. Richard Bowman uh, wrote a scathing critique of SDI based on how it's set up here, uh, which is basically uh, to put a missile system in the air over Russian airspace and shoot down missiles at the point of impact. That was the initial, before we got into the different phasings, um, that was kind of the initial layout of SDI. Um, but what I think the benefit of SDI was was that it was a research project. And I think that gets forgotten over time, at least my generation. So a lot of people here might remember SDI. It was before I was born. So, <laughs> so I think we forget about that. And what's cool about SDI uh, is that it traces all of its lineage, like current missile defense traces all of its lineage back to SDI. And the really cool thing I found interesting uh, is that SDI, because they were trying to decrease the cost of uh, radio frequency quadruple linear accelerators, so I'll say that three times fast, um, they were able to develop proton cancer therapy. So if you go to like the website, if you pull out your phone, go to Loma Linda University, they still use proton cancer therapy, and that's an offshoot of SDI, not to mention all the other space travel benefits. So the reason I think this is important to cybersecurity is I think we need to look at researching uh, with an unknown of what's going to come out of it. I think we need to research, uh, like SDI did, into different opportunity areas and potential innovation areas uh, and see what comes out of it. And I don't have an answer for what those things would be. Uh, proton cancer therapy is pretty interesting. Uh, the other stuff, when you look at SDI, they had to figure out how to refuel uh, the station out there, which led to advances in multiple other areas of space travel. Potentially some were predictable, but potentially some were not. So really, I'll go into my recommendations and conclusions now, kind of based on my research, and we'll get into the panel discussion. Uh, so the first dilemma I have here, I think there's two dilemmas facing uh, cyber strategists. And the first is, how can the United States deter cybersecurity, uh, cyber attacks on infrastructure critical to its national security from the range of potential attackers in cyberspace without being able to communicate the threat or cost to potential attacker? And the solution I have here, my recommendation is, is what I call general strong point cyber deterrence. And this borrows from George F. Kennan's theory of strong point deterrence he developed following World War II uh, to prevent the spread of communism uh, through multiple states. So what I talk about here is the implementation of cyber specific defensive measures. Um, really, you're not trying to communicate anything with a defender. Uh, the goal is to develop a defense which will filter out the range of potential attackers. So the goal is to deny state and non-state actors with limited resources.
and it does not require any communication from the defender. So if that's in place, I think there's a second question for cyber strategists. Uh, and the gist of this is basically, if you've filtered out the range of potential, uh, some of the potential attackers, well, how do you deter the rest of them from attacking your infrastructure? Because some will always get through, right? Do hey, bomber theory, bomber will always get through. So my recommendation is specific strong point cyber deterrence. And this borrows heavily from Keith Payne, who I think works right down the street. And it's really the focused elements, the focused application of elements of national power against a specific actor accounting for the following things. And really you're trying to understand that actor and develop that. But you can't do that unless the range of potential actors is filtered down to a manageable level. And that's what I think is the key. Is it possible right now? I don't know. And just like SDI asked, is it possible? Uh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. And that's part of my research is doing. So I'm going to conclude with kind of the seven lessons uh, for cyber defense uh, from my research that I picked up. And then I'll turn it over uh, to the team here. So uh, I think the initial layer of cyber defense uh, has to be denial to filter the range of potential actors. Cyber deterrence must be focused on strong points because perimeter defense uh, in the cyber world, uh, just like uh, post-World War II and Kennan's time, it's not possible. There's not enough resources. There's not enough time. There'd be too many holes. Uh, and criti critical infrastructure in cyberspace should be encrypted, decentralized, and concealed. So resources must be allocated to uh, research emerging uh, technology. You know, I think we need to do that research, kind of like SDI showed, by, by investing and researching and sharing with the civilian sector. I think the potential for innovation in different areas exists. A technology-focused general strong point uh, can lead to filtering to get to that more specific. And then the last thing is the specific strong point cyber deterrence. So that's kind of the, the gist of my research. Uh, starting with deterrence theory going through SDI and some of the lessons I have highlighted. Um, and a lot of that was contained in the essay and my broader overall work uh, that brought me here today. So thanks for listening to that and I look forward to uh, hearing from the panel here. Thank you. Go ahead, since you have, <laughs> you also have slides. Hi, good morning. Um, so, um, my name is Ian Williams. I work with the CSIS Missile Defense Project, and I'm going to be talking, focusing on missile defense today, on the missile defense side of things. And let's see if I can get the little clicker to work here. Here we go. Um, so, I'd like to thank Captain Torrance for his uh, extremely thoughtful uh, and interesting paper. I think he's got a great message. And, uh, and thanks to, to Mark and Sam for putting this event on uh, today. Um, so I'll be more or less piggybacking off of Captain Torrance's thesis and piling on with some of the, really the broader trends um, in, in missile defense development that we've picked up in our research, uh, first on SDI itself, uh, but then also a lot of the connectivity that we see between the, the work that was started in SDI and the missile defense systems that we uh, deploy today. Um, so first, I'd kind of like to first to combat one of the, I think, popular misconceptions of SDI as being the goal of creating a full societal 100% uh, impenetrable shield against anything that the Soviets could throw at us. This was not actually really the case. Certainly the President Reagan's rhetoric would leave a lot of people to, to, to think that, but when you get into kind of the, the DOD documentation and really the mission set of S SDI, it was, um, it was more limited than that. Um, if you look at SDI phase one, for example, the, the goal, which in, in terms of a timeline, where they were looking at really the end of the century, so around the you know, late 90s time, they thought you know, this could be possible, which is to be able to eliminate really a fraction, um, you know, less than 50% of a Soviet attack. And what this would do is complicate Soviet planning and essentially add to deterrence and be able to keeping the focus on protecting our retaliatory forces. So never really breaking out of the mutually assured destruction relationship, but guaranteeing the ability to, uh, for the U.S. not to be disarmed in a first strike. The second phase, which would have included, um, you know, started getting into more of the directed energy type of uh, technologies and an interceptor underlay, was, um, again, just expanding that same capability to guarantee what they called the survivable, survivability of a militarily significant amount of um, the U.S. Uh, nuclear forces, so that almost a guarantee that we can, again, enhancing deterrence, uh, that the U.S. won't be disarmed in a first strike. Um, and then the third phase was really just maintaining, the goal of the third phase was to maintain that, um, that capability, right? 
thinking that the Soviets would likely then uh, create countermeasures to our defenses, and then the third phase would be aimed at, at uh, countering those countermeasures to maintain that capability. So we were never really looking at a full societal defense against of our cities and population centers. It was always about maintaining that um, the survivability of our nuclear forces. So I think that's a, something interesting that a lot of, um, I think a lot of times we miss um, when looking at SDI. Um, so here is um, another point that I'd like to bring up is kind of the architectural continuity between what was set up, what was envisioned in SDI, and what we have today. So this is SDI phase one, right? This was what was envisioned for the end of the decade, or end of the century, I mean. And so you have, um, you know, you have a infrared uh, satellites to detect the launch of a missile. You have space-based interceptors that would be able to intercept some missiles in boost phase as they're launching. You have a space-based tracking system and ground-based radars to then track missiles um, and warheads during their mid-course. And then you would have ground-based interceptors that would uh, be launched to sort of clean up what uh, the space-based interceptors missed. Um, and that. And you also had an interesting, um, the GSTS, the ground-based surveillance and tracking system, was actually a, um, another sensor, a pop-up rocket, essentially, that would be launched up um, as needed to provide another phenomenology, another look at the, uh, at the incoming warhead. So you had multiple views of these, of these uh, warhead threat clouds. Um, but what you don't see here in phase one is often a lot of the stuff that people popularly could think of SDI. You don't see there's no directed energy here, right? There's no lasers. There's no, um, you know, mirrors in space that would be deflecting directed energy beams um, down into the Soviet Union. Uh, this was really the architecture envisioned for phase one. And you look at the architecture we have today. This is the ground-based mid-course defense system. You have um, a infrared satellite to detect launch. You have ground-based and sea-based sensors that will track the, um, the, the missile as it's incoming during its mid-course, and you have ground-based interceptors that will then be launched to intercept the missile. Um, very similar structure to what we had in SDI. Of course, the big thing that's missing here is the space-based assets. Right? We're missing a space-based sensor layer uh, that can track and discriminate, and we're missing the space-based interceptor portion. Um, but even now, you're, look at, you're seeing a growing support for the deployment of that upper layer, particularly in the space-based sensors. I think, um, I think if you, when you look at the next missile defense review, which will you know, hopefully be coming out within the next month or two, um, I think you will see uh, a policy movement towards developing that space-based tracking layer. So once again, moving closer and closer to what we would consider to be a, an STI phase one type, type architecture. Um, so, you know, Condoleezza Rice once remarked uh, for our, this current system, the GMD system, she said that, um, you know, it's not Star Wars, it's not the son of Star Wars, um, it's not even the grandson of Star Wars, is what she, uh, she said one time. And I would agree in that sense, I would agree in the sense of the scale, but not in terms of actually the architecture. Um, this is where I think she is correct. Um, so this is, uh, each of these bars here represents one, um, one of the either planned or deployed missile, de homeland missile defense um, architectures that we have. So early Sentinel and Safeguard, these were nuclear-tipped interceptors um, plans, and then ultimately what was deployed was the Grand Forks site, um, a single site uh, protecting U.S. ICBMs. Um, you can see much smaller in terms of the numbers of ground-based interceptors than was originally envisioned in the architectures. SDI phase one, which called for a thousand ground-based interceptors and a thousand space-based interceptors. GPALS, which was the global protection against limited strikes, that was the architecture envisioned um, during the administration of George H.W. Bush. That was to defend against, um, I think their benchmark was a single uh, Russian uh, nuclear ballistic missile submarine going rogue and firing its missiles. That was the, the benchmark of what we would need to defend against that. And that envisioned, um, you know, I think 700 ground-based interceptors and, uh, again, 1,000 space-based interceptors. And then you get into the four, the, the Clinton, Bill Clinton administration's national missile defense architecture, which had four phases, an uh, initial operating capability, uh, the capability one, two, and three. And even the capability one um, 
had called for 100 ground-based interceptors. Um, and now you can see what we have actually deployed is, um, is right now we had 30, uh, built, built up to 30 under the administration of George W. Bush, uh, 26 in Alaska and four in Vandenberg, California, GBIs. And uh, we have now moved up to 44, um, looking at we're moving up to 64. So what we really see is this kind of high ambition um, followed by uh, very minimal realization. Um, so when you consider it in the context of even the Clinton administration's national missile defense architecture, what we have today is really not even um, to that scale, which was a, a already significantly scaled back. Um, so that's where I think uh, Secretary Rice is definitely correct when she says it's, um, it's, not, it's not the grandson of Star Wars. Um, so another point is um, you see a lot from between SDI and what we have today is we see a lot of program continuity. And this is where I think, um, as Captain Torrance mentioned, it's the research and development side um, where we really get a lot of the benefit from. Um, almost everything we have today, I would actually say everything, every missile defense system we have deployed today, both regional and homeland defense, uh, can trace its uh, roots back to uh, the strategic defense initiative. And this is just one example. You have the homing overlay experiment, which actually started a little bit before SDI. And you can see this pretty much a continual line of development going from that homing overlay experiment, which was that fun funny looking thing at the bottom there. It looks like a bicycle wheel. Um, that was the first thing to ever hit, uh, hit to kill, you know, kinetic kill another object in space. And that was done the first time in the early 80s. Um, and that led to, um, to really the ground-based interceptors we have today. Um, I won't go into all of all this stuff, but even if you look at things like THAAD, you know, you can trace that back to the, um, the high endo-atmospheric, um, high endo-atmospheric defense interceptor, the HETI uh, program. You can trace that back to it. The Aegis Standard Missile 3 interceptor, you can trace back to the LEAP, the Lightweight Exoatmospheric Projectile Program, which was a program to miniaturize kill vehicle technology that was started in SDI. Um, the Patriot also got its start, I believe, in the errant, I want to say the errant program. Um, and, and I think some it took some technology from HETI as well. Um, so everything we have today, we, we owe back to the research and development done um, under STI. Even, the, even Brilliant Pebbles, the space-based interceptor, a lot of that kill vehicle technology um, translated into the, the, the exo-atmospheric kill vehicle, which you see at the top picture there, um, the kill vehicle on top of the GBI, um, had a lot of, shared a lot of design similarities to the Brilliant Pebbles that was going to be deployed under, under GPALS. So everything we have, and we see the same thing with the, the sensor architecture. Right? This picture here below is a Brilliant Eyes, which was part of the GPALS, um, which actually traces its roots back to, to other programs in SDI. The Brilliant Eyes space-based tracking. Above there, the picture up there, you have the STSS program, which was um, an experimental um, uh, demonstrator program that we have for a space-based tracking uh, system. Um, we only have a only have two satellites in orbit, it's not operational, but um, again, it's the basis for what hopefully will be a space-based sensor layer. Um, but then again you, again, you see this continual line of development going all the way from STI to, to everything we have today. Um, so, and another, you know, why we have this program continuity, I think is from one of the other really great things that we got from SDI, which was the SDIO. Right, the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization, which was stood up during SDI, it was a, you know a body of military and civilian um, uh, personnel dedicated to uh, solely dedicated to developing ballistic missile uh, defense technology. That is a legacy that has stayed with us today. We started with the SDIO, that eventually became the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization that existed during the 90s another organization dedicated to the development of missile defenses, and then that has now become what uh, is today the Missile Defense Agency. Um, so that's pretty unique. You know, had we not had the SDIO, we would not have had this continual line of, of an independent organization dedicated to the research of this technology, which I think is, if there's one thing we can maybe learn for the cyber realm is, is that, just having that, that kind of dedicated body to this specific mission that's independent 
from the from the services, um, I think is, is is a really valuable thing. Um, and you look at the missile defense. We were talking about um, Captain Torrance was talking about a um, the speed of which cyber threats develop. Right, that was a problem with the Bush administration. That the George W. Bush administration really saw with ballistic missiles. You have this rapidly developing threat. So how do you keep up with that threat? When they rechartered BMDO into the Missile Defense Agency, they gave MDA special authorities, special acquisition authorities, which allowed them to do things with their funding that others, say like the services, could not do because of the, the DOD acquisition process, right? They're able, MDA is able to use, say, research and development money to, f to take systems, test them, and then field them. If you look at the GBIs we have in Alaska, defending us against North Korea, all of those GBIs were actually purchased not with procurement dollars, but actually with research and development dollars because of the special flexibility. They're able to take that R&D money and then make minor improvements, make incremental improvements to, the, to all of these systems, and put these in the field into operation with essentially R&D money. So it's a lot more flexibility. They're able to be a lot more reactive. And I think that's, um, that's something, as we look at the cyber threats, maybe something, uh, a model that, another model that we could follow. So, um, so how does a lot of this, uh, you know, apply to the cybersecurity challenge? You know, I'm not entirely sure, but, um, you know, I think if you look at STI, I think the, the, uh, the urgency that President Reagan put, the, the, how it, they raised the idea of, of uh, missile defense in the sort of consciousness of, of the United States, I think is really uh, important, and I think that uh, that kind of leadership, I think, on cybersecurity is also really needed. So, um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. Thank you. Mike. All right, thanks very much for coming out on a Friday morning. This is, uh, I was, telling our, our friends earlier uh, at Harvard, at school, no students ever show up to anything on Fridays, so uh, we never do anything on Fridays. So it's wonderful to actually have human interaction at the end of the week. Uh, I'm running a, a research program on cybersecurity that's often conflated to mean I'm the help desk. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I can help you with your iPhone, but what we're trying to do is actually help design a research program and a research agenda around conflict and cyberspace. So a lot of the issues that we're talking about here today, doing our best to pull together graduate students, practitioners, foreign, American, private sector, and government to help think about these things in a more complete way. Uh, I think it's worth spending some time thinking about the missile defense analogy that we've been, we've been talking about. And it's not just because in academia, we have all this time to think about whatever we want. But in 2013, actually five years ago this month, General Alexander, who was the director of NSA and the first commander of Cyber Command at the time, in testimony to explain his high-end national mission force of offensive hackers, said that it's like missile defense, Senator. That's what we're developing this force to do. We're developing it to knock down incoming missiles. It's like counterforce, Senator. So I mentioned that quote because Cyber leaders in the U.S. military have themselves referenced what we're talking about this morning to justify budget dollars and, and other things like that. So it's, it's not nuts, right, that we're having this conversation. Uh, and it's important, obviously, to reflect on, on history because there's a ton we have to learn. And it's also the language of history is the language we speak in. Um, at, at the school, I mean, we're obsessed with economics and models, but who talks like that right? at, a, at a dinner party or just in, in normal conversation? Most people, most of the time, think about history, think about analogies that they know of from when they were growing up or other experiences. So it's good that we're, that we're thinking about it. The main point I want to try to impart on you about why there's an important difference between what we've been talking about so far about missile defense and the challenges we face in cyberspace going forward is the role of private companies. This is very, very different. Okay. With missile defense, strategic defense initiative, those kinds of threats, basically a military to military kind of threat. Okay. So when we talk about developing missiles, yes, private contractors are let contracts and then they develop different aspects of technology, the interceptors. Of course, the private sector is involved, but it's a fundamental different 
kind of involvement. You have an iPhone on you? Hopefully not. You have an iPhone on you? You got an iPhone on you? I mean, you got a dumb phone? Very wise man. Give you a hand here. This is the ball game, right? The endpoint, the actual devices, right? The systems. They're not made by the U.S. government, right? The missiles are made by the U.S. government, right? The tech, all that kind of stuff. This is U.S. government property that the U.S. government can own, the U.S. government can interrogate, can change, can modify. This is Apple's. U.S. government doesn't get to go in here as much as it would love to. The U.S. government doesn't get to go in here and muck with what's inside here. And yet the U.S. government must defend this somehow. All right. So who's got internet at home? Right. Who are you paying $200 a month to? I don't know who the providers are down here, but it's probably, you know, we all know who the, the big companies are. Right. They're the providers of this service. That's the attack vector. It's not really a government issue. You're not paying $200 a month to the Treasury Department for internet. You're paying it to a private company, right? As your vulnerability or your strength is mostly determined by that private company, right? The computer you're using to access that information, it's a Dell, it's a Microsoft, it's an Apple. That's what's determining how safe you are or how not safe you are, not the government. So I think the biggest challenge when looking at the historical analogies in other areas of national defense is to recognize that in this space, in cyberspace, the role that companies have is so important. If you're going to talk about defense, you cannot have that conversation unless you're going to account for how you would like, in a perfect world, the Verizons, the Comcasts, the Apples, the Microsofts, how do they get brought into that conversation? You had Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook on CNN the other night saying, I actually saying, I and the Mark Zuckerberg first person saying, I'm okay with regulation. It's just a question of how. Right? That's a remarkable statement right? from, from that sector, which has traditionally fought tooth and nail to block any type of regulation. So this conversation is, is evolving from even where it was two years ago to now recognizing that the role that these companies play is so powerful, and yet we have not had a conversation, not just in this room, but in society, about accountability. We have not had a conversation about who's accountable for when bad things happen on a private company's platform. I'm not picking on Facebook. It's, it's not just a Facebook thing. It's not just a social media thing. It's an internet service provider thing. It's a cloud service provider. Everyone loves the cloud. Cloud service provider. These are all private platforms, private initiatives. It's not clear who's accountable. That is a failure of our elected leadership to not have that public policy in place. That's what we need to be working towards for the future. Let me, let me note one other note about deterrence. Uh, the captain's trying to write a dissertation on deterrence. So uh, the main thing he's got to do is pass, right? The, the, the point of a dissertation is to pass it, not to be the, the right, right? It's to get a good grade and get your PhD and be done. So I'm very supportive of that. Um, I think the next step in the research becomes weighing deterrence as an option to keep America safe versus other options to keep America safe. The research question was how should deterrence best work? One step beyond that is, if you don't have a lot of faith in deterrence, what else might be in the toolkit? And for me, I place a lot more stock in the ability to degrade how foreign adversaries and hackers actually conduct operations. Right? Basically, if, if you wanted to borrow the language from nuclear, which I don't, but if you wanted to, it's counterforce type of work, except it's, it's not nuclear missiles. It's just a fundamentally different kind of technology. And it's not actually, it doesn't have to be that escalatory. It's just very different from nuclear war fighting. Right? So the danger of some of these analogies is that we psych ourselves out too much from keeping a lot more flexible options on the table for keeping us safe. Right? I mean, if the kid is beating the other kid up with a baseball bat, you can try to play mind games with him and say, beating him up with a baseball bat is not a good idea. Or you can just take the baseball bat away. And at some point, we got to be a little more comfortable with taking the baseball bat away. That's offense. There's no need to be shy about that. Right? That's offense. The government says we are in the business of 
when necessary, conducting offensive cyber operations. There's a time to do that. You don't do it like a crazy person, right? But that has to be an option. You don't do it to deter. You don't do it to play mind games, to, to be a psychologist, to say, we're going to come after you so that you recognize, you have an epiphany that hacking doesn't pay. Guess what? Hacking pays right now. There's a reason it's happening a lot. The psychology part of this is not going to work in the short term. You got to take away the baseball bat. We got to be a little more proactive to keep the country safe in that way. So let me wrap it up there. And then the fun part is uh, getting to talk with you all about your questions. Thanks. as the moderator and ask a couple of questions and then we'll uh, go to the audience. But uh, my first one is about lessons that we should not learn from missile defense in that long effort because when I first put the announcement out about this uh, event, one of my former colleagues came back and, and said there's a lot you shouldn't learn. He was very skeptical about missile defense. So, are there things that, that we should not do? Or we, Jim. Yeah, there, there's one example I'd like to discuss, and then I, and I'll defer to some more expertise here. But in 1976, we finally completed uh, the Safeguard Missile Defense System. I think we spent about $6 billion, and it was literally obsolete upon inception. Uh, we had tried to, to build a technical solution at a fixed point in time based on an older threat. Uh, and it was operational for about five months in the, the Northern Plains out there in North Dakota. South Dakota, and then it was dismantled. Uh, so when Reagan was looking at SDI, there's people there that are remembering this. Hey, we just spent $6 billion on a system that, that literally was not effective. Uh, so how, how can we, I think the lesson to learn is to not spend uh, money for a fixed defense system knowing that one iteration by the enemy uh, will render it obsolete. And that was one that really stuck with me reading about um, Safeguard and just how, how much money was put into something that was never really protected anything. Okay. Anything you want to add on that, Ian? Because some um, people would argue that maybe that's what we've done with national missile defense. That, yeah, that's uh, certainly one of the lessons I think that, that uh, certainly the, Bush, the, the George W. Bush administration took to heart when they restructured BMDO into the missile defense agency was this recognition that this is different. You know, we cannot wait you know, 15 or 20 years for a missile defense system to go through the standard DOD 5000 acquisition process, that the enemy has a vote and the enemy is going to, be, you know, create, especially in North Korea, if you see the advances, how quickly they are advancing. Um, we simply can't wait. We need to, this is an, an iterative process. Um, we need defenses in the ground, but we need to be able to have the flexibility to use, to use you know, funding to make iterative developments to those things. I mean, when they first envisioned, you know, GMD in particular, I believe it was Secretary Rumsfeld who said, you know, this is no, there, there will be no fixed or final architecture of the Homeland Missile Defense System. And I think that um, is, is a response to some of the, those lessons learned, that uh, we need the flexibility. And, you, you know, if, if the U.S. is to lead, the U.S. government is to lead a big effort, I think, on cyber, that's one thing that we can draw is, we have to change how uh, we spend money, how, you know, if, the mil if this is a military-led thing, we have to change how, um, how the military acquires and, and, and employ deploys and employs uh, new technologies, which right now is very slow. The good news is that former Secretary of Defense Ash Carter uh, recognized what, um, what her colleague was just saying and actually put a lot of initiatives in place to, to try to do that. And the Congress has recognized that as well and has given special budgetary and acquisition and requirement setting authorities to the new Cyber Command to work on that. So we can sleep easy. That's good. Right. But good one, one you know, lesson I would make sure we don't learn from missile defense is thinking that the problem is over there and that somehow it comes this way and we can block it. It doesn't quite work that way because the problem is everywhere. <laughs> The problem is here, too. The, you have to think about this recognizing that it's not just an international or external attack surface. Right? It's, it's all here. The routers here <laughs> in the subway, uh, right? Well, you get internet through, uh, through a Verizon connection, some of you in the, in, the, in the metro. That's all equipment and infrastructure that you have to 
think about how it's vulnerable here, inside the country and inside our devices. So it's not necessarily a, a problem that can just be dealt with out there by the military. It's a problem that you have to be accountable for domestically, not just with law enforcement, but private, private actors as well. Let me, let me follow up on that because you, you make the very important point that with cyber, unlike with missile defense, that's first pervasive through society and of course private uh, companies are at the forefront because they want to provide a service that is uh, reliable and doesn't put them on the evening news on the defensive as we've seen in the last couple of days. Um, what about networks that the Department of Defense does control, like SIPR? Uh, are there, is that a different, is that different in kind? Because that is now entirely, you know, under DOD's control, it can limit who has access, it also has to design the entire uh, system on its own, there's you know, an equivalent um, you know, a, a network at the top secret level. Um, is, this, is this different? It's different in the sense that the government, and specifically the military in that case, has the authorization to be more active and uh, implement measures on that network. So that part is, is positive, but it's still, the military uses commercial off-the-shelf technology just like everybody else. So in that sense, not, not to, so different. To, to build its special system, you know, network. I know one concern um, is actually the cybersecurity of our missile defense systems. Um, you know, we, they don't like to talk about it much, and it's, you know, the, the level of cybersecurity implementation in, in, our, in our BMD systems is, it's hard to, to assess from the open source, but I know there was at least one incident, um, I believe in Turkey, when um, a Patriot battery was hacked um, by, uh, by an unknown, uh, unknown entity. So there are vulnerabilities there, um, and from you know, what I've heard through the rumor mill is that, that, that we are behind in that sense. Um, cyber vulnerabilities to, to the systems themselves. So we have, I think we have some catching up to do on that front. So well, uh, what's interesting for me is not only do I think about our CIPRA connectivity, but one of the first questions I always ask when I'm planning some type of communications operation is where's the power grid? Are we running our own power? Or are we hooking up to local power? If it's local power, uh, there's studies for days, but Todd Humphreys and his team at the University of Texas did a study where they showed you can uh, spoof a GPS uh, synchronous timing through a power distribution unit remotely and basically trip power grids relatively easily. Uh, so one of the things I always worry about, it's not even just the security of the network, it's am I gonna be able to keep my network on, uh, if that makes sense. So, you know, and, and to your point uh, earlier about cyber being everywhere, you know, it's not just uh, the network itself, it's how am I getting power to it, who are the third party people that are servicing the network, and how do I, have, you know, constantly determine that that's gonna be safe, which I can't, but it's fun to try. Okay, let, let me ask a question about the role of uncertainty. And certainly with missile defense, that was an important consideration. People argued that, you know, that, that the, I mean, it was technologically impossible. You know, the testing program, of course, was, uh, you know, had successes and failures. Uh, they argued you know, that the, the concept was flawed. But at the end of the day, the, in those days, the Soviets, could never really be sure whether it would work or not, and apparently took a very pessimistic, from their point of view, uh, approach so that the Soviets really wanted to get rid of this because they were worried about what it might do to their um, uh, you know, strategic deterrence. So we, irrespective of whether we thought it would work, they thought it would work, and they had, you know, militaries typically will take a very um, uh, pessimistic view about um, adversaries' defenses because, you know, they want to sort of worst case it. You know, is there an equivalent in cyber defenses or is this a situation where they're probing every day so that they really know what will work and what won't? I, I think if you read the news uh, on any given day, you don't have a lot of confidence in defense. I, I don't think there's a lot of uncertainty. I think people are, feel very certain <laughs> that if they want to 
uh, break into a network they're not supposed to have access to, they can probably do it. Uh, so I, I don't think there's very much uncertainty uh, that's out there right now. Uh, and we could stand to create a lot more of that uncertainty, but the we in that sentence uh, can't just be a question about government action. And, and the big, another big difference is that there's much less to lose from attempting a cyber attack as opposed to attempting a nuclear attack. You know, if you attempt a nuclear attack and fail, there's a lot. You're probably going to have some nuclear weapons headed your way as opposed to a, a failed cyber attack. You really don't, you don't have much to lose from that, you know. And let me, well, let me follow up on that. Because one of the, one of the differences maybe is about effect, you know, that is, we, we know what a nuclear weapon will do. I mean, we've dropped, of course, two uh, during the Second World War, and there have been lots of tests and lots of analyses. And you know, we, we know that the, what the effects are, and of course, they're very catastrophic. We don't really know what a cyber effect can do. You know, we've seen denial of service and you know, things that are you know, essentially at the level of annoyances. There's concerns about power grids. There are concerns about um, um, you know, functioning of you know, basic services. Is, is that where this, the uncertainty may lie? Uh, I'd like to, it's a little bit different than your question, but I think it's important to, to note. When you drop a nuclear weapon, it, it blows up. When you inject a, let's call it a cyber weapon, when you inject a cyber weapon or deploy it, there's gonna be a certain amount of time and whoever you deploy it on is going to also have that capability. And I think it's a different mindset to think about it. And, you know, if every time we dropped a nuke, if that country could then reverse engineer it right away and have it, I think it'd be a lot different to think about it. So in cyber, one of the things I often think about is when you, when you deploy that weapon, like a, a Stuxnet or anything else that has been deployed, uh, eventually it can come back at you. So have you uh, patched yourself from that potential vulnerability or are you deploying something too early or how do you match your effect if it's like a zero day vulnerability so that you don't uh, use your element of surprise and your decisive advantage from a military term too early. And I think those are things that I often think about uh, outside of the, the weapon itself. It's what strategic considerations to make sure I can get everything I can from this and not have it come back at me. Anything you all want to add? Remind me the what the question <laughs> part was. The question part was, we know what the effects of nuclear weapons are. Ah, uh, yeah. Can we? We don't really know what the effects of cyber is, and is that where the uncertainty may lie? Well, there's a, a pretty good amount of certainty about what is happening today and what's been happening for 20 years, right? and it may not be killing people, but that doesn't mean there aren't effects. Uh, I mean, a, a colossal amount of intellectual property has been stolen from this country and its companies. Uh, I mean, that, that is an effect. So we know enough to know that what the effects that we have seen are not good. And we should be doing a lot more, not just to deter that from happening again, but to make sure it cannot happen again. Now, we can always brainstorm what other kinds of effects might be possible in the future. That is the, the stuff of science fiction, or fiction, without the science. But what I would submit is that it is far harder than it, you might first think to create persistent effects. That is, it's very popular to talk about the grid going down, down, down. But to keep the grid down is a different question, right? So I would, I would submit that while it, we, we can dream up these different kinds of attacks and horrible things that could go wrong, Think about how you can, how would you would just use computers to keep something down. And that's actually harder than, than you would think. Okay, uh, let me, I'm gonna ask one more question and then I'll give you the, the first one after that. And the last question is um, this question about the deterrence. You know, with missile defense, uh, we knew that if missile defense didn't work, that we had a backup of nuclear deterrence, mutual assured destruction. Um, I mean, if it, say if it didn't work, at least in theory, uh, we had this backup theory. With cyber, it wasn't clear that we really had a backup deterrence theory, unless you adopt what you suggested, Michael, which was that you have an actual, you have an offensive capability that you use and make the point to people that, that you know, this will happen to you if 
you try to uh, um, breach our defenses. So we have uh, not only a defense, but we have this deterrent um, um, effect from using an offensive capability. And I just wanted to probe, what would that look like? Uh, make, you know, what would you do to intruders to make the point to them that there's a, there's a price here? So there's a distinction in, in what, what we're talking about. The first is you're talking about making a point, so deterring, versus what, what I was trying to get at, which is degrading their ability to act. You very, it's very hard to make a point in cyberspace alone. If you want to make a point to somebody, you find what's most valuable to them, hopefully you get it translated right, and then you squeeze. That often is not their computers. We're the ones who have the most vulnerability in our networks and our computers. We went first. Internet was born here. We connected far more of our infrastructure very early without any mindset of security. Many of our adversaries are not that vulnerable to receiving a message in cyberspace that would somehow say, oh, I don't want to go there. If you steal all their money, they might say, oh, I don't want to go. If you threaten right, other forms of uh, what's really valuable to them, they might be deterred. Uh, I am very pessimistic in the ability for the United States or really for, for any country to threaten through cyberspace and, and convince somebody, again, Jedi mind trick somebody, that it's a bad idea. But that doesn't mean you can't use offensive cyber operations to make it so that the other side has a much harder day trying to accomplish what it wants. The goal is different. The goal is not to convince anybody of anything. The goal is just to make sure they have a much harder day. That you can do. The, the mind games I'm, I'm very skeptical of. Okay. I guess that opens up the question of you know, kind of cross-domain deterrence or what other things outside of cyber um, can we can we employ? Can you sanction us? You know, if we know, can can you identify? You know, if a state sponsor of uh, of cyber intrusions, um, are, are, you know, sanctions, um, other kinds of tools of state power that we use in other areas like nonproliferation, um, is there potential there to uh, to be able to curtail at least the state sponsored? Uh, and that's activity? what I discussed. Uh, so you guys are facing this way. So I, I talked about. Uh, if possible, leveraging elements of national power, which at least in the military, how we use it is diplomatic information, military and economic, uh, in order to do that. So kind of like you said, Michael, and uh, that's kind of how, how I see it. Uh, is it possible? I'm not sure, but I think if we do it, it can't be cyber specific because the mind games won't work. It's a matter of how do you, do you understand that actor enough to impose a cost uh, that will make him or her unwilling to initiate? Okay, okay great. So the first question over here. There's a microphone coming. I'd like to direct this to Captain Torrance. And as a citizen, what should I know about my networks? I have no idea how many networks I'm on. What should I expect my internet provider to be doing with regard to security? We just simply click accept terms of service. And we don't actually know what that means. So how secure are my networks so the one thing I usually tell people when they ask is if somebody really wants to get your information they will uh, not very comforting uh, but what I would say is there's there's some basic measures you can take uh, I look at it like if all your doors are unlocked uh, there's some certain measures you can take to kind of lock your door so if someone if you will in cyberspace is checking it'll at least make sure they have to do some work to get to you uh, the specific answers whatever I say would be is not the most uh, like, like VPNs and stuff are all acceptable measures for baseline uh, cybersecurity, but that's just one element of many things that you can do. I think the, the question is, uh, it's a hard question. And one of the things that I've been working with now is there's, I think you read an article, Michael, a while back, there's this idea that uh, if we educate users, that'll make systems stronger. And uh, I think it's the wrong paradigm to look at networks. Uh, the question we often ask from, from a network professional is, uh, if more users equals more vulnerabilities, how do we treat that? Um, it's a little different than your question, Mr. Schultz, but, uh, but, but I think the question needs to be, how do we strengthen, how do we leverage the amount of users on our network to make it stronger? Because education, I could teach you stuff all day. Uh, I mean, I could get hacked easily tomorrow. I could teach you stuff all day. I don't think that makes a network stronger. So I think we, we need to figure out, both civilian and military, uh, how to flip the question on its head and, and strengthen the network uh, 
with its amount of users as opposed to looking at them as vulnerabilities. Um, because anything I give you would be tactics, and then tactics isn't going to help in the long term. It might help you for a week, a day, an hour. Dual factor authentication. Great. Uh, well, okay, right, right, right over here. Hi, Alexander Nelm of uh, George Mason University. So, first question is about. Um, so, Mir Shama wrote in that we might miss the Cold War because in the age of multipolarity, you might see lots of smaller states get access to nuclear weapons and that would complicate balance of power. Uh, that did not seem to happen as much, but how does cyber play into that in the comparison, given that all 200 something states and more non-state actors have access to a computer? Does that change uh, strategy and balance of power? Another question is specifically for Captain Torrance. Um, how can individual vulnerability be addressed in the military? So for example, like we've had this scandal with the Fitbit trackers exposing like troops in Syria. And can you imagine any radical changes in the United States, such as what the Russian army did, basically banning like smartphones for all their troops? Okay, we have two, two questions. questions. Well, why don't you start, uh, Jim, and then we'll go to the general, your, your, your question about s cyber as a proliferation issue. So for the military, I mean, obviously, so this is me speaking on behalf of myself, not for the, the military, let me make that clear. Uh, I think the, the, the smartphones and the trackers, that's something that needs to be mitigated. Well, let me take that back. I don't think we can mitigate it. So my question would be, I talked there about shelter, mobility, and concealment, and dispersion. If we know we're going to have signals, uh, I would offer that more false signals would be needed to drown it out. I would obfuscate it. I don't think we'll ever be able to hide it. Uh, when, I, when I plan communications operations, there's often this idea that if we stay dark for an extended period of time and only come up when we need to talk, it'll be hard to track us. The problem is, in the darkness, if there's any light, for lack of a better analogy, it's easy to pinpoint something. But if you flood it with signals, it's much harder to figure out where things are. Um, so it's not the best answer to your individual soldier one, but I think if we create more confusion and uncertainty, uh, the run routes, all that, I think more data being flooded will make things uh, flooded in, will make things harder uh, to detect. And that's kind of how I'm looking at it now. Yeah, you could try to minimize all of it, but what if there's one person out there that has it? How easy is that to figure out what's going on? As opposed to the other way, uh, when you figure out how to make things more confusing for somebody trying to look into that information. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it now. Uh, I don't have an answer, but that's my strategic like way of approaching the problem. Anything about cyber as a proliferation issue? Uh, so Kenneth Waltz uh, wrote a really book, uh, a good essay called like, Why Iran Should Get the Bomb. Uh, this isn't defending Waltz, but it's easier. His words are better than mine. But he talked about how um, more nuclear weapons equals more uh, stability. Uh, and he thought more people should have them. I think that's one of the last things he published before he died. And it very, it's very similar to uh, Kissinger's Westphalian order piece uh, of the balance and multipolarity occurring. How that relates to cyber, I don't think cyber shifts the balance of power. Uh, Moises Naim talked about this, the rise of micropowers. I, does think, I do think it leads to a rise of micropowers that can challenge state actors, but I don't think we're at the point now where it's shifting the balance of power, but I'll let them discuss that. That's kind of my initial thoughts on it. I, I would just say that the main distinction is on motive. So yes, it is easy for a lot of countries, a lot of crooks to get access, not just to a physical hardware necessary, but to the services online to conduct malicious activities online. But the motive is usually different. The motive most bad guys, rough countries, whatever, you know, would have is not to start a war with the United States in cyberspace. It's generally to spy and oppress their own people. It's a tool of domestic oppression and surveillance. That's generally what's, why countries and other folks have been really interested in this kind of technology. So there's a lot of Focus, I, I would put, when you talk about proliferation, on the motive for why different states and actors are getting access to these things. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Ray, uh, Ray Copson, I have a blog called U.S. Political Forecast. It seems to me one thing that has kept us safe from nuclear war uh, has been arms control and arms control negotiations. 
both in terms of building confidence with our adversaries and actually limiting warheads. Uh, we're still under operating under the New START agreement. Uh, so I'm wondering, doesn't arms control have a, a role to play? Uh, we're on the verge of a, a whole new nuclear arms race, and we're learning that we're only starting to think about how to deter or fight cyber war. Uh, so wouldn't it be a good idea to reintroduce the arms control dimension? It's a great question, and I think uh, an expansive understanding of arms control as opposed to just disarmament, which is just one aspect of reducing a stockpile, but arms control broadly is worth pursuing. I, I think it's worth, though, uh, reflecting on an unfortunate reality, which is that I think most states, most of the time, still think it pays to hack and that the benefits outweigh the risks. I don't think there's actually a broad appreciation of the, the inverse, like in the nuclear world, where the risks of nuclear war are too terrible. That I think we could all agree on, that the risks of nuclear war are pretty bad. Um, I think a lot of countries and a lot of bad guys out there still think that it's worth it. It's worth it to try to hack and, and conduct malicious cyber activities. And until that changes, it's going to be very difficult to get state-based consensus to say nothing of how you get private parties and private companies to actually participate. I mean, I think for, you know, and, and from the you know purely nuclear and missile defense side of things, um, you know, to have arms control, you know, you need somewhat parity. You know, so really we're looking at right now the future of arms control. I think is still bilateral with, with Russia in terms of nuclear reductions. Uh, Russia doesn't seem to be very interested in that right now. Um, they're building up their forces, you know, in any capability. Um, and who knows when New START expires, we'll see if they, if they continue to, if they increase in numbers as well. Um, but, you know, we have, uh, as the, you know, kind of going back a little bit to the Mearsheimer, um, as we have more states coming online when getting nuclear weapons, North Korea, possibly Iran down the road, um, you know, we have had this kind of dichotomy where we have, we have maintained the sort of Cold War structure of kind of mutual vulnerability, mutually assured destruction, and strategic stability with, st with states we have more parity with, like Russia and China, even though there's a bit of a disparity there, we still have that kind of relationship with them. But we've used then missile defense as a tool for limiting those kinds of mutually assured destruction relationships, right? Where we've, d we've evolved this relationship with Russia over many decades, um, an understanding of vulnerability and how, and how it works. And we have the red phone and all, you know, the lines of communication and arms control agreements where we can inspect each other's stockpiles. You know, we don't have that kind of relationship with North Korea and I don't think we're going to have it. So missile defense in that sense is a way that we can limit these kinds of uncomfortable, dangerous, you know, mutually assured destruction relationships for emerging actors. I'm not sure if there's an applicability in cyber, you know, and we can do this with North Korea because we have a lot more money than North Korea. We have a lot more resources, uh, while creating a defense against Russia would be probably financially impossible. Um, so I'm not sure if we can, if that has any applicability to the cyber world, that model, this kind of dichotomy of, of arms control with some and, and strategic superiority with others. Uh, <clears throat> Rich guys who are very interesting observations, but I would suggest that the parallel between cyber risk in the broadest sense and the analogy to nuclear arms race is inappropriate. Number one, we don't really know who all the bad actors are. In the cyber world, it could be an individual, an organized crime, a rogue state, a non-state, uh, ISIS, or countries like North Korea. So number one, we don't know where the villain is. Number two is we are so digitally controlled in that our water supply system, our sewer system, our railways, our uh, communication systems, uh, air flight control, uh, emergency responders all rely upon some digital system. And they're all vulnerable because we don't ask or demand that a utility company like Dominion Power for Northern Virginia, be protected against cyber attack. They don't spend the money necessary. The telephone system, uh, all the other systems, the stock market, 
they're vulnerable to hacking. And yet, we don't really seem to have a national program that says, if you operate a business that's critical to our functioning, you must ensure to the best of your ability protection of that system. We let Facebook do all sorts of things, and now Zuckerberg is trying to restructure that. They lost, what, $60 billion on the stock market? Uh, they should probably lose more because I think it's disastrous to have uncontrolled dissemination information and unverified. You don't do that for newspapers or television stations. So you keep looking at this as a parallel, like the Soviets against America, when we don't even know who all the potential bad actors are, and we don't require private companies like Google or any other company to really protect our information. Could you address that, please? Sure. So, um, so I don't think they are completely analogous situations. When I conducted my research, it was how can I extract uh, general principles of deterrence and strategy from Cold War missile defense and apply it to cyberspace. So they're general. Uh, you know, in more of my writing, I discuss that I that I think that's a huge problem is the proliferation of actors and there's innumerable amount of actors. You talked earlier about arms control, and we, we discussed mostly on the panel here about state actors, arm control, but how do you conduct arm control, arms control with non-state actors? So I think it's a problem, so I don't really know how to answer your question. I think it's a huge problem, and that's why I think what everyone's trying to do is figure out how do we address that the most appropriate way, and I don't know the answer. Uh, they might have some better enlightening answers here. If you could nail the second, you would, I think, moot the first. So you, we actually had a pretty decent idea of who's doing what, um, and in part that's not necessarily because the U.S. government is so talented and so special. But there's a ton of private sector security research companies out there discovering and publishing who's doing what that's bad online. We got a pretty decent clue. Not perfect, but guess what? The criminal justice system isn't perfect either. Right? Mistakes happen there too. Errors happen there too. So in the scheme of things, I think we have a decent clue of who's doing what, to varying levels of detail. But the ball game is on the second point that you make, and I think you're absolutely right. But when you say we don't have a national program to do it, what it, it I think in practice means is there is no requirement to do it. There is no law. There is no liability. There is no way to sue. So that's, that's where the, the X factor is right now. Um, in the back there. Um, Adam Edelbrick, Wesleyan University. Um, I'm curious about the overlap between just regular life and cyber attacks. Uh, we kind of talk about like a Stuxnet type thing that seems to be like a military attack, but when we're talking about what's happened with Facebook over the past couple of days, that wasn't a cyber attack. That was somebody using a cyber platform to buy information. Cambridge Analytica, you know, bought it from that researcher. So. A lot of the attacks we think of, like perhaps Russian interference in the 2016 election, that was a psychological campaign. There wasn't like hacking going on as much as people buying, the Russians buying ads that would influence people that they knew would because of their data. And those two things seems to, seem to be in an area of great overlap. And uh, Dr. Stillmeyer, you kind of spoke about this earlier about like it's all in our phones all the time. So I'm kind of curious about. What about that side of these attacks? Um, thank you. Great question, and uh, very necessary to distinguish all the different things that are happening. And when you, uh, I mean, we, we make a living off of saying the cyber a lot, right? Uh, it pays very well. But the reality is there's a lot of different kinds of problems going on here that are not all gonna be addressed doing one thing. There's no cyber solution, hence there, I don't like the cyber defense, deterrence thing. It's a lot of different bad activity. Some of it involves hacking or gaining access to a system you shouldn't have access to. A lot of it doesn't. It's just bad, we just don't like it. So what you're gonna do about how social media can be abused by people who are taking advantage of opportunities that are left open to them is different than what you're gonna do, for example, with internet service providers. Right? who have the opportunity to be proactive on defense and they hesitate at times to take advantage of it. There's 
a lot of different problems out there. So I think you're absolutely right to make sure we're, we're trying to be good and distinguish between malicious acts that we're seeing. Maybe one more. David Lanham with Brookings. First of all, thanks for the insightful conversation, everyone here. Uh, I have a two-parter. First, for Captain Torrance, you mentioned throughout your presentation about communication between the defender and the, and the, and the attacker. When you got to your recommendation slides, if I read and heard you correctly, you talked about the lack of communication from the defender to the attacker. If you can elaborate, why would that be advantageous versus having that communication? That would be the first question. Second, for Michael, what would be the reality of taking away the baseball bat? You know, what does that look like in real life policy and implementation? So Dave, for your first question, uh, I think there should be communication. Uh, my point is that in cyberspace with a range of potential actors, you can't effectively communicate with every potential initiator. So it's just not possible, it's not practical. It's the whole idea of kind of perimeter defense. And even when we could, you know, when you look at a lot of the literature about uh, Cold War deterrence, we didn't effectively communicate with Russia. Uh, we thought we were communicating one message, they were receiving it another way. So there's this problem of, uh, first of all, how do we defend or, or deter? Uh, Michael's got me thinking about my words now, right? But how do we effectively deter when we, how do we deter when we can't communicate uh, with all the potential initiators? Then if we can filter the range of potential actors to a manageable amount, well then how do we communicate with them to make sure that our message gets through to them and they receive it as intended? So that's kind of how I'm looking at it in a two-part uh, piece. Uh, there's a number of things you can do, and the key thing here is that it doesn't all have to be aggressive. Uh, for example, uh, calling a foreign internet service provider and explaining to them that their terms of services are being violated by a customer, a malicious customer who's abusing their infrastructure, the internet service provider can turn them off, cut them off from using the service. Uh, we don't have to call it offensive cyber war, but that accomplishes a pretty helpful outcome, right? which is that the adversary has, at least temporarily, lost access to a service, a platform, call it whatever tech word you want, that they would otherwise have and be able to compromise and, and run ops from. The point here is you're looking for a variety of things from that, which is more subtle, right? to also being able, when asked, with international law fully in mind, making sure allies and partners are fully on board, can't ignore that stuff, but being able to delete systems, right? Delete hard drives, wipe systems, modify credentials, so that the adversary, again, has a much harder time. The objective here has to be realistic. People say, well, they'll just rebuild, you know, or the offense has the upper hand, you know, they can just, all they have to do is find one weakness. Not so, actually. If you force them to rebuild constantly, people make mistakes. They're humans on the other end of this who are trying to carry out objectives. When they make mistakes, we watch. We learn, we get smart, we exploit the next round. So I can, I can work in that space. A great question. Great, well I think we've come to the end of our time and I wanna thank our panelists for coming out this morning and participating in this great conversation. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.